These children come from very unhappy circumstances. She just wants to be held. You can't leave them like that. You've applied to open a home? Yes, I have. They don't need to be tamed. They need to be loved. These are children in care who, in a perfect world, should go back to their parents. <laughs> Sarah Lancashire in the drama premiere Seeing Red, coming soon on ITV. of ITN, the news, with Sharon Gray. Good morning, the headlines. Blair announces new war on drugs. 80 dead in mine explosion in the Ukraine. And Michael Schumacher wins the Australian Grand Prix. Police and the courts are to benefit from tough new legislation to win the war on drugs. Tony Blair says stronger powers to confiscate dealers' assets will form part of a hard-hitting bill in next year's Queen's Speech. Those convicted could have their passports removed, while there will be tighter regulation of club bouncers and greater help to treat addicts. Here's Tim Nielsen. The Prime Minister announced the new initiatives on his way back from yesterday's trip to Russia. He told reporters, We have got to crack down very, very hard on the drugs industry. Parents are petrified about drugs. A problem as big as this needs radical thinking and action. Police and the courts are to be given tough new powers in a hard-hitting drugs bill in next year's Queen's speech. They'll include the power to confiscate drug dealers' assets. According to Downing Street insiders, mansions owned by drug dealers could be seized if they cannot prove how they legally acquired the property. Anyone convicted of drug offences will be liable to have their passport withdrawn. Suspected drug dealing by bouncers in nightclubs will also be targeted. In particular, there will be tougher regulation of bouncers and greater help for rehabilitation and treatment of addicts. The Prime Minister will also reappoint the drug czar, Keith Halliwell, for another three-year term. The crackdown came in the wake of the Prime Minister's shock that nearly 300 people die in Scotland from drugs each year. Tim Nielsen, ITN. An explosion of deadly methane gas is being blamed for the deaths of at least 80 coal miners in the Ukraine. It's the worst mining disaster to hit the former Soviet Republic in decades. And it's claimed fears have been voiced in the past over safety at that mine. Neil Brown reports. Yet again, Ukraine is grieving for its miners. 80 pitmen dead this morning, 274 dead last year and 360 dead the year before. Ukraine already has the world's poorest mining safety record, but yesterday's disaster is the worst for more than 20 years. Once again, it was methane gas which exploded, the colorless, odorless gas which seeps out of coal seams and builds up in poorly ventilated shafts. The blast happened more than 2,000 feet underground in the pit some 500 miles from the capital, Kiev. 33 rescue teams battled through the night to bring out more than 200 men alive. Seven are now in hospital. Ukraine's mining equipment is outdated and frequently malfunctions. Its miners battle to obey safety rules. The industry is underfunded by the government and safety concerns have low priority. This morning, the President Leonid Kuchma and Premier Yushchenko have both cancelled foreign trips to take charge of the investigation. Another 48 miners have already died in pit accidents in Ukraine this year. Neil Brown. ITN. Tony Blair has flown home after his first private meeting with Russia's Vladimir Putin. He warned the acting president over alleged human rights abuses during the conflict in Chechnya. But Mr. Putin remained keen to extend a warm welcome. Mr. Blair is the first Western leader to visit him since he came to power. Our Moscow correspondent Mark Webster reports. Together with the Blairs at the Opera, Russia's acting president and his wife were clearly on the campaign trail. With presidential elections only two weeks away, the image Mr. Putin wanted to project was of two dynamic statesmen establishing a new understanding. 
Yet in talks at a former royal palace near St. Petersburg, they clashed over the issue of alleged Russian atrocities in the Chechen war. However, when I asked both leaders in public about the timing of the visit, they tried to minimize their differences. Isn't the timing of your visit going to send the wrong signal to the international community about your concern for human rights abuses and encourage you, Mr. Acting President, to carry on the sort of policies that some of us have witnessed for ourselves in Chechnya? No, I think it's immensely important that we stay engaged with Russia. Where we have disagreements, we make them clear. I have made it very plain myself that it is important that any human rights violations are properly investigated and that there is proper access for all the international organizations. For me personally and for the Russian leadership, Mr. Putin said, it's important to understand his concerns about human rights in Chechnya and, if necessary, to make adjustments. Later, when the two couples arrived at another royal palace, nothing was allowed to disturb the image of the hitherto rather colorless Mr. Putin mixing easily with other world leaders. A marked contrast to the erratic and often embarrassing behavior of his predecessor, Mr. Yeltsin. As Mrs. Putin took Mrs. Blair, whose baby is due on May the 24th, to a child creativity center, electioneering in Russia took on a decidedly Western look. Coming at such a sensitive time, this visit has clearly been a calculated gamble by Mr. Blair. However, the British government seems to believe that whatever criticism it might receive for coming here now will be outweighed if the visit does lead to the establishment of a lasting and stable relationship with a former superpower. Mark Webster, ITN, St. Petersburg. Chile's Ricardo Lagos has become the nation's first socialist leader since Salvador Allende was ousted by former dictator Augusto Pinochet in a violent coup in 1973. More than 50 world leaders attended this swearing-in ceremony. The main figure absent at the ceremony was Pinochet, who returned to Chile a week ago after Britain decided he was too ill to be sent to Spain to face a trial on tortured charges. Many Chileans carried banners calling for Pinochet to be put on trial. Socialist supporters are now enjoying a two-day street party. Sport now, first motor racing, and Michael Schumacher of Germany won the Australian Grand Prix in Melbourne for the first time. There was huge satisfaction in the way the 20-year-old British driver Jensen Button drove. At one stage, he was in fourth place before mechanical problems caused him to withdraw. Here's Nick Qureshi. This year's Formula One Drivers' Championship season got off to a flying start in near-perfect conditions in Melbourne. Last year's champion Mika Hakkinen first into the opening bend. Britain's Johnny Herbert began his campaign badly, packing up on the first lap. And his Jaguar teammate completed a disastrous opening Grand Prix for the new outfit, with Ulsterman Eddie Irvine going out after a collision. Next of the British contingent to fall was David Coulthard, out with an engine fire after lying second. So it looked as though it was going to be Mika Hakkinen's race. He had a comfortable 30-second lead over Michael Schumacher until his Mercedes engine forced him out of the race on lap 19. Schumacher, who'd never won in Australia in nine attempts, increased his lead at the midway points to a massive 24 seconds over Heinz Harold Frensen, who was to retire soon after. Meanwhile, Britain's 20-year-old Jensen Button had quietly driven through the field and now found himself in fourth spot. Remember, this was his first Grand Prix and he'd started from the back road. It was a brilliant debut, but it wasn't to last. Eventually, with 11 laps left, he too was forced out with a mechanical failure. Schumacher in his Ferrari duly completed the race to win and take the full 10 championship points. Rubens Barrichello in his first race for Ferrari was second and Ralph Schumacher driving a BMW Williams was third. 16 races to go. Nick Qureshi, ITN. Prince Nazim Hamed celebrating a convincing win to retain his world featherweight title. He quickly dealt with South African challenger Vayani Bungu, knocking him out with a spectacular punch in the fourth round. Hamed's victory could set up a big money fight with Mexico's Eric Morales. Football and Leeds United need to beat Bradford this afternoon to stay within sight of Premiership leaders Manchester United. The Old Trafford side is seven points clear after their 3-1 win over Derby. 
Dwight York, without a league goal since December, scored a hat-trick as United finished comfortable winners. Just down the road at Anfield, all eyes were on Liverpool's new £11 million signing, Emil Heskey. Heskey was just two minutes into his debut against Sunderland when he was fouled and Liverpool were awarded a penalty. Patrick Berger scored from the spot. And Berger scores! But Sunderland fought back and Kevin Phillips scored a late equaliser, also from the penalty spot. Liverpool move up to fourth, and Chelsea stay third after their one-all draw at home to Everton. Dennis Wise, who scored for Chelsea in the Champions League in midweek, was on target again. There were plenty of goals at White Hart Lane, where Tottenham beat Southampton 7-2. Chris Armstrong hit a brace of goals, and Stefan Everson completed a hat-trick in the final minute. Elsewhere, Aston Villa beat Coventry 1-0, Newcastle beat Watford also 1-0, Sheffield Wednesday won at home to West Ham 3-1 and Wimbledon beat Leicester 2-1. And now for a look at some of the main stories on the front pages of the Sunday papers. The Observer says Tony Blair's being warned he could fail to win an overall majority at the next general election if he continues to ignore the party's core voters. And more advice for Labour, party strategists say Frank Dobson should shave off his beard if he wants to win the election for London mayor because men with beards are considered untrustworthy. The Sunday Telegraph says David Blunkett has abandoned his fight against grammar schools, claiming that campaign was part of a past agenda. This comes after the result at Ripon Grammar School last week, where parents voted to retain the selection process. Sheree Blair is pictured with the wife of Vladimir Putin during the Blair's visit to Russia. The Independent on Sunday claims the Halifax is lending thousands of pounds to customers regardless of age or income, so they can buy shares through its online share dealing service. The Sunday Times says that former Cabinet Minister Jonathan Aitken, who was jailed for perjury, had contemplated suicide following his political downfall. According to the Sunday Express, the Prime Minister is so alarmed by the increase in young drug users that he's launching Britain's toughest ever clampdown on drug pushers. The Mail on Sunday says a Labour minister let slip at a meeting in America that Tony Blair plans to hold a general election on May the 3rd next year. The Sunday Mirror claims the Home Secretary will announce the killers of Jamie Bulger will be released in three years' time. And the News of the World pictures George Best recovering in hospital. It's now 18 minutes to six. You're watching the ITV Morning News. Coming up, our review of the week. Join us again after the break. Dear Burtons, I have always been more than satisfied with your products. However, upon opening a Viscount bar today, I found not cool mint cream, chocolate and biscuit, but a, a Rollins rapid fire stapler. Yes, yes, and a mitten. I am returning the offending items and look forward to receiving compensation, underlined, for the distress this has caused. Yours expectantly, Geoffrey Hill. <laughs> Geoffrey wins again. Ah, oh, it's too easy. Jeff's mental about new Viscount bars. This perfume is for me. And this perfume is for my home. AmbiPure air fresheners use real perfume in an adjustable diffuser so that you can select the right ambience for your home. Perfume created by AmbiPure. The greatest hero of all time and introducing Young Indiana Jones. Buy the Indiana Jones box set and get a bonus Young Indiana Jones video. Now available at W8 Smith. Welcome back to the ITV Morning News. Today's top story. Police and the courts are to benefit from tough new legislation to win the war on drugs. Tony Blair says stronger powers to confiscate dealers' assets will form part of a hard-hitting bill in next year's Queen's Speech. And now our look back at how ITN covered the week's news. On Monday, RAF helicopters finally joined the aid effort in Mozambique, delivering food and flying their first rescue missions. 
It came as weather reports suggested the country was about to have fresh downpours of rain. ITN's Mark Austin joined the RAF flight crews as they started work. A British search and rescue helicopter scouring from the sky the flooded villages of the Limpopo. Suddenly they receive a call that hundreds of people are marooned in one village where there's little food and no fresh water. Within minutes, the Royal Air Force crews here are carrying out their first rescues of this crisis. These are people who thought they'd been abandoned. This was their chance to get out, and they were determined to take it. This young boy's parents are apparently stranded by the floods in another village. They will not know yet that he has survived. This village was completely cut off by the floods. Despite the fact that they're now receding, scores of people still want to be rescued here. Two RAF Pumas were involved in the evacuation, which was mainly of children and the old. A South African helicopter also took part, but there were simply too many people to cram in. These women and children had to wait their turn. And when exhausted villagers saw what was going on, more and more of them emerged to claim a flight to safety. As we left, still the people were coming. The Royal Air Force may have been dispatched late to Mozambique, but it won't worry these people, who this evening were just pleased to see them. Earlier, we joined one RAF crew delivering emergency supplies to stricken villages. Food for people who want to stay put, now the floods are receding. In some villages, it was aid they didn't expect, but were nevertheless delighted to receive. I mean, you saw it yourself. They want the food and we're delivering it, so it's, it's good work. Feeling better. Several days on, there is still great suffering here but by the hour more outside assistance arrives. It is the RAF giving a much-awaited helping hand. Mark Austin, ITN, Southern Mozambique. Also in Mozambique, aid workers are getting to grips with a heartbreaking legacy of the floods. As our Africa correspondent Tim Hewitt reported on Tuesday, the tragedy of the children who became separated from their parents. In a small town in Mozambique, they are organizing an identity parade. For 11-year-old Marcos Antonio, it's yet another harrowing experience. He is one of Mozambique's lost children. There are 100 of them here in Save alone, and at least 50 more nearby. As floodwaters destroyed their homes, they were separated from their parents in the scramble for safety. Now, a British aid worker is organizing the effort to reunite the children with their families. Polaroid photographs will be shown around refugee camps. Even if immediate parents are dead, um, die during the cycle in the floods, we should find another family member for the child to go and live with. So a lot of these children don't know whether their parents are dead or alive? No, they don't. And sometimes the parents sent the children for their own safety, and sometimes they were split up as they were fleeing or, or you know, with the water, in the water. Angelina Victorino, who's 11, is too nervous and shocked to talk, but it's believed her mother is alive. Our demand that he doesn't know that the child is here, of which maybe probably she's very worried. The lost children of Save were being organized into groups for outdoor classes, an attempt to reintroduce some sort of normality to their disrupted lives. Aid workers here are confident they will reunite most of these children with their parents. But in a country with so many problems, that can seem an impossible task. In the tented refugee camps, meanwhile, the search continues. The photographs and the forms are the start of a difficult process. This is a country where communications are haphazard at the best of times. Now, an operation like this is infinitely more difficult. So the suffering is far from over. For Marco, bewildered by his own photograph, and for Angelina, bewildered simply by life itself, there doesn't seem much to hope for. For the children, lost and alone in this wretched place, home still seems far away.
Tim Ewart, ITN, Save, Mozambique. On Wednesday, the Chancellor Gordon Brown announced a budget crackdown on Britain's black economy. A report commissioned by Mr Brown put the cost of the hidden economy at up to £80 billion a year in tax evasion, smuggling and benefit fraud. To combat cheating, the government's proposing a two-strikes-and-draw-out system. People who cheat twice will have their benefits stopped. John Draper had this report. Britain's black economy, conducted in pubs and the backs of vans, often by people claiming benefit, and the lost tax revenues no small beer, enough to fund the NHS twice over. Alcohol smuggled across the channel is a prime example. We believe that thousands of jobs are being lost every year in people who work in breweries, in pubs and in distribution trades. We also believe that the Chancellor's missing out on about £150 million a year. Many of those convicted of alcohol smuggling also claim the dole. Of those involved in all aspects of the hidden economy, including counterfeit goods, 120,000 are claimants. The new report calls for a two strikes and you're out approach, so benefit would be stopped for those with two convictions. There'd be a new offence of evading income tax on top of the existing theft act, more frequent signing on at job centres, and a confidential phone line for people who want to come clean. The millions saved could, according to one ex-minister, buy drugs for cancer and MS patients. That way there will be a mass of support out there for the government. It will make sure that there are fewer hiding places for those people who are actually stealing off all other taxpayers. This anti-fraud report was commissioned by the Chancellor Gordon Brown and he signalled that he'll use his budget in two weeks' time to implement its main recommendations. John Draper, ITN at the Treasury. And finally, in our look back at the week, the topic that's dominating domestic politics in the UK. Ken Livingstone's bid to become the independent mayor of London. His decision to quit the Labour Party and fight against his old colleagues is the biggest political breakaway since the SDP was formed in 1981. Harry Smith reported on the career of the one-time GLC leader who's trying to return to a modern version of his old job. Kenneth Robert Livingstone. From his early years in local government, he's been a hero to the far left and a thorn in the side of government. As leader of the Greater London Council, about to be abolished by Margaret Thatcher, he called a snap by-election in protest and when he won, sent a message to the government which could have been repeated today. A government that ignores a substantial body of opinion in its capital city does so at its peril. He's a Londoner born and bred, with a childhood spent in Streatham. He now says he'd never want to live in any other city. His garden is dominated by a pond he built himself and stocked with his treasured collection of frogs. His biographer says he's a loner both in his private and his political life. I think it goes back to the days when, as a teenager, he first of all started with astronomy, then he went into uh, amphibians, wandering around on his own, collecting things in the, in, in the dead of night, Move, moving into politics where he has not been part of a team but has been trying to develop ideas which are his own ideas which he thought the party would turn to in time. There's no doubt some of his ideas have been popular, such as cheap fares on the underground, but others, such as public support for Sinn Féin at the height of the Troubles, were widely condemned. I think this is uh, why the uh, Blairites think that he, he's a loose cannon, too much of his own man, and not able to cooperate. But his supporters say he has the rare knack of being able to talk directly to the voters. If he has, the last message he sent them from County Hall may yet prove to be prophetic. Harry Smith, ITN. This is the ITV.